Well, we uh, give greetings to uh, those of you who are <coughs> listening and watching. We trust down in uh, Utah. We think we have some of the bugs worked out. We don't have the system developed completely at all, but at least we're making progress, and we trust this is going to uh, to work, and it will be uploaded on YouTube, we trust, um, later this week or uh, first thing next week. So, Reading to all of you, we're going to have a word of prayer as we get started here in Rapid. And we're going to be beginning today with uh, Genesis 25. <clears throat> we take comfort in the fact that, that we're halfway through almost, and uh, we have a whole day to work on it. <laughs> but it's going to move very quickly, as we'll see. We'll, uh... So again, welcome to those of you who are with us in Utah. We thank you, Father, for this good day. We thank you, Lord, for a good night of rest, and we thank you, Father, for the great privilege that we have to live in the light of the knowledge of your glory. And we pray now that you will open our uh, eyes and ears and our understanding to take in what you have prepared for us in your word from long ages past. And we pray that, that what we learn today will serve your gracious gospel purposes, your kingdom purposes in our lives and through our lives. <coughs> thank you for these who are here, and thank you for those who are uh, there in uh, Utah and joining with us uh, as we trust and we commit this day and ourselves into your hands for your glory name of Christ. Well, I have to apologize. I don't know, after all that bragging I did, it doesn't appear to be working quite correctly with bandwidth or something here. Well, uh, I mentioned that we would start with chapter 25 of Genesis and of course, uh, the end of, uh, the, or I should say, the beginning of chapter twi- uh, 25 is the end of uh, Abraham's life. The uh, story of Abraham, even though um, the uh, the total dote here, that section, as we have uh, described these sections, is called the total dote of uh, Abraham's father. Of course, not Abraham himself, uh, Terah. So, uh, chapter 25 tells us that Abraham took another wife and had other children. And uh, this, well, of course, after the uh, death of Sarah and uh, a wife for Isaac. We talked about all that on Monday. And uh, Abraham uh, died his life uh, 175 years. We read in verse 7. And uh, Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Pelah. In the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, we come across that, the, the purchase that he made of that field to bury his wife Sarah. This is a, this is an interesting passage in a couple of ways. For one thing, it tells us, of course, that uh, uh, Abraham, uh, having been given the ability to father a child at age 100, was uh, able to to do much more and uh, had many other sons. But it's also interesting in that, that uh, even though Abraham, uh, and, and of course the, the New Testament talks about this, the fact that that uh, Abraham had many, many sons. But there was only one son, as we have uh, seen. We've described that. There, Isaac was the son of promise. That's why Sarah is so important, because obviously Abraham could have had, and did have, he did with uh, Hagar. Could have had uh, many, many sons as he as he did, but only the son of promise is um, uh, is significant in Genesis. And then it's also this passage is also interesting in that it shows us something, and we see this very same thing with the death of Isaac. And that is that uh, in verse nine, Isaac and Ishmael. His sons buried him. So there is a there is a reuniting of Isaac and Ishmael. And the same thing happens with Jacob and Esau. 
whenever Isaac dies. It's very interesting. These brothers who have been estranged uh, come back together with the death of their father, respectively. Which is interesting to me because in verse 5, or in verse, yes, Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, the one he gives to the other sons, yeah. and still. Yeah, and, and still they came back together. Okay. Fascinating passage. Well, in uh, beginning in verse 12 and down to verse 18, we have the seventh of the Toledot. This is still in chapter 25. These are the generations of Ishmael, the Toledot of Ishmael, Abraham's son. And uh, a very short passage. We are simply told about uh, some of his descendants. We are told uh, the names of his sons, verse 13, in the order of their birth. And uh, then the, uh, the record of his death, he lived to be 137 years old, verse 17. And then uh, the land where they settled. And of course, we, we know a good deal about Ishmael already and the kind of man he is. And uh, the fact that we're told where he settled kind of prepares us for the later history of Israel and their conflicts with uh, the Ishmaelites and such. But other than that, it's not a terribly, terribly significant passage. Then in verse uh, 19, the eighth Toledot. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. And uh, Isaac was 40 years old when he took the, his wife, Rebecca, of course. We talked about that again last week. And uh, we also talked about Isaac as the forgotten patriarch. And, you know, the evidence that he was a rather sensitive soul and, uh, and a spiritual man, a man of prayer, Again, insofar as we have evidence, we don't have we're not we don't have a biography, but uh, we have uh, enough to tell us that he was a man of some spiritual discernment and care. And uh, one evidence of that, of course, is uh, very important in the whole account of Isaac, because his wife, as was true of Sarah, his wife is Barak. And it's a similar kind of story in a way, and it's dissimilar in a way. It's similar in the sense, of course, that Rebecca can't have children, as Sarah could not have children. Uh, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. So uh, here's one difference in that for Sarah and Abraham, there's this long, long wait. And continual reaffirmations by God that that you're going to have a son and by Sarah, not by Hagar, not by anybody else, but by Sarah. But in the case of Isaac, the, the impression we get, at least, is that this all happened very suddenly, or, or at least fairly quickly. Isaac prayed, Rebecca conceives. And our, our sense is that this didn't this didn't take a long time. The Lord granted his prayer. Rebecca, his wife, could see. The, uh, I guess this would be a reminder, although I, I, I can't stop and do this at every verse because we have too much to do. But I guess, you know, this is one of those reminders of which we have many in Scripture that uh, uh, God's, God's timing in answering our prayers is his timing and not ours. And, you know, sometimes uh, the prayers come quickly as they apparently did here. At, at other times, uh, you know, it seems to go on forever. And Abraham, Abraham is asking why, 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 when, 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 who, who, who. <coughs> so, well, at any rate, uh, the Lord granted his prayer. Rebecca conceived. The children struggle within her. Another difference, of course, is that when Sarah conceives, only the one son, in fact, the whole emphasis of, of those early chapters of Genesis is that uh, there's going to be a son. And here we have twins. Sarah could not have had twins. That would, that would not have been in keeping with the uh, promises of God. But even here, there is evidence of God's choice. God's grace. And Paul refers to this in Romans chapter 9. And the prophet Malachi, and, and Paul 
at that is quoting from Malachi chapter 1. Well, the uh, story goes on. The children struggle within her. And she went to inquire the Lord. And the Lord's answer was, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. And then the prophecy. Uh, the one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. This is, this is a theme in the scripture. That uh, the older serves the younger. We're going to see this in... Uh, in um, Jacob's blessing of uh, the children of Joseph in chapter 48 of Genesis. Uh, Manasseh is the oldest. Ephraim is the youngest. And Joseph places the two boys so that the right hand of Jacob would be on Manasseh and the left hand would be on Ephraim. And Jacob crosses his arms. <laughs> and uh, Joseph uh, the scripture says he is displeased. In fact, the Hebrew is a little stronger. But uh, Joseph reassures, I mean, Jacob reassures him that this is of God and that uh, this is God's choice. The, that the uh, younger will rule over the older. The same is true of Joseph himself. Joseph, uh, the younger, in fact, one of the youngest, he's not the youngest of. Jacob's sons, but he's the youngest adult son, we could say. And he has the dreams that he's going to rule over the family. And of course, that's what touches off that long series of, of uh, that saga of Joseph's life. So, uh, again, we see, yeah, we see this all through uh, David himself. David, the youngest of the boys of Jesse. Keeping the uh, sheep out of the fields. And Samuel says, well, don't you have any more sons? <laughs> okay, well, all this again, just uh, one of the many, many, many reminders in Scripture that, uh, that God's ways are not our ways and that His, His grace is, um, is never, it, it, grace is never according to human reason. In, in that sense, you could almost say grace is not reasonable. Someone has said, um, has used the term, uh, I think it was Michael Card in one of his songs, he, he talks about uh, God's outrageous grace. And that, uh, it's not a bad way to say it. So the, the twins are born. The first, Esau, comes out red. All his body like a hairy cloak. Uh, you know, one, one of those babies, we've all seen the babies born who need a haircut. <laughs> that was evidently uh, Esau. And then uh, there was delivered Jacob holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob and the name literally means uh, the one, he who takes by the heel or something like that. The boys grew. Esau, as we know, was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob, a quiet man, dwelling in tents. And, uh, you know, here in verse 28, we have a statement that that is it's reflective of what we read all through the book of Genesis. That these are real people. They are subject to real human weaknesses <coughs> and faults. Of all kinds, and yet God's purpose is not is not undone. You know, we see this in the case of uh, Dinah and the uh, uh, that on which Lily is going to report a little bit later. You know, this is it's a mess. It, but that's the way people are. You know, I'm I'm a pastor of a church, and it's just a mess. <laughs> There are, you know, I say this on Sunday sometimes. I'll, I'll say, you know, I can go up and down these roads, and uh, every single one, you know, on every single road, there is a, there's a wayward child or a wayward spouse or some habit or some compulsion or some other major crisis or issue. I mean, that's just. 
human life. And, and Genesis doesn't sugarcoat it. These are not presented as glowing heroes. Uh, the, the, they're not hero stories. They're people stories. And so we see here uh, exactly the kind of thing that happens in human life, even among Christian, uh, Christian people, well-meaning people. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. There was, the, there, there was the dad's guy and there was the mama's boy. Not Just not that unusual. <laughs> well, okay, and that of course leads into, uh, into a remarkable story. We've all read the story about uh, Jacob uh, cooking stew. Evidently it was a lentil stew. And Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted, and he asked Jacob for uh, some of that red stew, he says, for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. <laughs> and uh, the name Edom, uh, it doesn't mean red exactly, but it, but it sounds like a Hebrew word for red. So uh, apparently that was a nickname that kind of stuck to him afterwards. It, it may have had something to do... Also, with fact, it says that when he was born, he was red. But, you know, it doesn't say that here. It says that it was because of the stew, this red lentil stew. And another theme that is introduced here, well, I shouldn't say introduced here. We've seen it already. But all through Genesis, we see this time and time and time again. Deception. And we see time and again in Genesis this theme of, of, of doing the right thing in the wrong way or for the wrong reason or, or trying to force God's will. So um, Rebecca had already been told that the younger was going to serve the older. And of course she wasn't in on this ruse, but she was later. Another deception later on that Rebecca actually instigates. But, uh, and, and this is not so much a deception as it is uh, opportunism. Jacob takes advantage of his brother. Uh, but, you know, what, what's uh, interesting about this is that uh, Jacob would not have been able to do this if Esau had cared about his birthright. And so there are two sides to this story. There's, there's the Jacob side where he's just opportunistic and taking advantage unjustly, but there's also the spiritual um, uh, emptiness of Esau. So uh, sell me your birthright. Esau says, I am about to die. Little drama king there, <laughs> probably. Uh, it's hard to imagine he was really that hungry. but uh, Or that he couldn't have uh, prepared something himself. But he, at any rate, we don't want to read too much between the lines of what use is a birthright to me? You know, what, of what use uh, is seed? I need to eat right now. And uh, completely ignoring the fact that the birthright is not for today, it's for the rest of his life. So, of course, as we know, Esau does that, sells his birthright for a bowl of stew. Incredible story. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop right there just, just for a brief moment. So, once again, my, uh, my apologies to those who are watching this in... Uh, Utah, we're having a little bit of, uh, on this end at least, at what appears to be technical difficulty, but at least I trust you could hear it okay. I did test it last night. It worked fine. So so um, it's a work in progress, and we'll keep trying to improve this. All right. Uh, we're going to move to Chapter 26. We've got to make we've got to make some tracks here, I think. <clears throat> chapter 26 is... Uh, a kind of a replay 
of uh, chapter 20. I think it was chapter 20. Yeah, where Abraham journeys into the uh, land of, it's called the land of Gerar. And we talked about that. In, uh, near what is today the Gaza Strip of Israel. The, uh, in the land of the Philistines. And uh, there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the uh, days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, and I've already I mentioned then, I mentioned again, that Abimelech is probably a title, not a name, as was true of Pharaoh. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give these lands. This is a very interesting statement, especially in light of what happens later. So here Isaac is told specifically not to go to Egypt. And yet later, in fact, th this, is, this is the whole end of Genesis. Uh, virtually from chapter 37 on is the story of how God prepares a way for Israel in Egypt. That's, that's the whole end of Genesis. And yet here he says, don't go down there. That'd be an interesting test question, wouldn't it, Mr. Lillard, to ask? Why, why here does he forbid going to Egypt, and why, at the end of the book, does he go to great pains to explain that, that God prepared the way for them to go? And, of course, Abraham went to Egypt before, when there was a famine. And that's kind of the, that seems to be the reference here. There was a famine, as there was in the days of Abraham, or besides the one, Abraham did go to Egypt. Isaac is commanded not to. You know, we have this, we saw the same kind of thing with regard to uh, Isaac and uh, Jacob and their wives. Abraham refuses to allow Isaac to go to Mesopotamia. But Isaac sends Jacob off there. You think maybe it has something to do with Isaac? Was, it, was there something about Isaac himself? That, uh, I mean, was, was there something Abraham saw in Isaac that uh, concerned him so that he refused to allow him to go? Was there something about Isaac that would have, that would have, um, that would explain why the Lord refused or commanded him not to go to Egypt? Was there a susceptibility there? Was there a, Kind of a predisposition, maybe, to compromise or something. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm speculating. Could have anything to do with Hagar and being an Egyptian, and who knows? Yeah, who knows? I, I, I don't know. I don't have an explanation. Um, unless, it, but it is curious that in both cases it's Isaac. God says you can't go to Egypt. Uh, Abraham says, no, Gehazi, you can't take Isaac to Mesopotamia. And yet, they send Jacob off <laughs> with no problems. And Jacob goes to uh, Egypt. And Abraham goes to Egypt. So, you, you would think it's not, it's not somehow a, a principle that they can't go to Egypt because God prepares the way for them to go. So, there must be something else. And I, you know, we don't want to speculate, but it is, it, it is an interesting question to ask. Um, but he, but there again, he does tie it somehow to his uh, to the promise that he will inherit the land. But that same promise was made to Abraham, and it was made to Jacob. Um, well, one of those uh, very interesting questions of Scripture: Why here and not there? You know, why does Paul uh, circumcise Timothy? in Acts 16, and refused to circumcise Titus in uh, Galatians 2, 1 or 2. Well, so verse 6, Isaac settled in Gerar, and it, it's almost exactly the same scenario as with Abraham in the same region and for the same result. I, I mean, for the same purpose. So, uh, at any rate, to, once again, the the deception, and we, we've come.
across this again. Deception is uncovered. What is this that you have done to us? Virtually the same thing that the king had said to Abraham. What have you done to us? One of our people might easily have uh, lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So, uh, uh, once again, God's blessing falls despite what uh, Isaac had done, just as it had fallen on Abraham. Very similar. You can, you can see why liberal scholars who, who believe that all this was kind of put together like a scrapbook, you, you can begin to see why they might say, again, I'm not trying to defend them, but uh, you can begin to see why they might say that these are really just two stories and they've somehow got confused and separated. And, because they are very, very similar. It's, it is amazing how much like what Abraham did, Isaac did. And very sim the aftermath, very similar as well. Uh even to the point of having the struggle. The herdsmen of Isaac and the herdsmen of Abimelech and the struggle is over a well again, as it was then. But, uh, so Ab Abraham continues to dig wells until they stop, uh, until the conflict ends. He moves far enough away. And again, that's similar too in the sense that, remember, Abraham took the initiative to make a covenant with an agreement with Abimelech. And uh, here, the same kind of thing. Just as Abraham said to Lot, go wherever you want to and I'll take what's left. And he gives to Abimelech uh, these animals to seal the covenant. And here, Isaac uh, moves further and further, digging wells until finally there's no conflict. And he says, verse 22, and he moved from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Jehovah, uh, which means a broad place or a broad uh, or, or or just room, saying, "For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land." I have a friend, actually a former student of mine, who was for a number of years pastor of a church in the in metropolitan Atlanta, named Jehovah. And it, I mean, it was quite a church. Uh, has a long, uh, fairly significant history. And um, anyway, that's the name of it. Piece of trivia that will serve absolutely no useful purpose in your life, I, I imagine. But <laughs> oh, okay. From there, he goes up to uh, Beersheba, and uh, Beersheba. I know I talked about it a little bit uh, the last couple of class sessions. I've been to Beersheba many times. And uh, Bob, if you're watching this, uh, you'll remember Beersheba. You'll remember the Bedouin market that we, uh, we visited, took in one Thursday. Beersheba is, you know, it's, uh, it's a common place in, in the Old Testament to describe Israel as the land from Dan to Beersheba. Uh, Dan, the far north, you could throw a rock from Dan and hit Lebanon. I've stood on the tail at uh, Don, or Dan. And uh, Beersheba is not actually the southernmost part of Israel by any means. It's, it's quite a distance from there to uh, Elot, or the, the biblical Ezion Geber. But, uh, Beersheba is right at the edge of the desert, and it's on a highland. So you go east from Beersheba through Arad and other places, and then you go down into the Dead Sea Valley. And if you go due south from Beersheba, uh, you you really are in the desert, and then you hit the Gaza Strip and Egypt and such, and it's not very far from Beersheba. So Beersheba. Uh, and to this day, it's, it's true. It's it's kind of the capital of the Negev. It's the it's the biggest city by far in that region, and um, so it comes up a lot, and and that's why it's 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 the traditional 
southern boundary, even though it really isn't the southern boundary by, by quite a bit, but everything beyond that is just desert. And the Israelites wandered in that part of Israel, that desert south <coughs> of Beersheba, <coughs> until they finally uh, moved into the Promised Land. But they came a different way. They didn't come straight through Beersheba up into Hebron. They went around to the east through uh, Moab. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so Beersheba is an important place in the Old Testament. And uh, from there he went there, as I, as I said, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and, and said, reiterating the promise that he's made to Abraham before many, many times, I am the God of Abraham, your father, fear not. I am with you, will bless you, multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. Just, just so we keep in mind you know, when God reiterates the promise to Abraham, I mean, he mentions the land, and he mentions um, the, the uh, descendants, but the, the great issue for Abraham is that you've got to have this son. It's the son of promise. Because there can't be a multitude without a son. There can't be, well, for that matter, they can't be inheriting the land without that son. Because there's nobody to inherit. But the focus is on the Son. It's the Son of Promise. Um, this is going to become more and more important down the way, but the, when God reiterates the promise to Isaac, he emphasizes, not the Son, because that came fairly effortlessly. Rebecca was barren. Isaac prays. Two sons are born. <laughs> and, uh, of course, then Jacob will have many sons. But, uh, the emphasis is on the the, uh, the multitude that's going to come, the nation that's going to come from these people. And as we're going to see, that's a very important, that becomes a very important point because uh, one of the issues we'll see in chapter 34 is the possibility that Israel could disappear. That's, that's part of the threat of chapter 34. And it comes up in other places in the book of Genesis. The possibility, when, when Joseph goes to Egypt, uh, this famine is so severe. I mean, uh, Joseph says specifically, in chapter 45, he says specifically, the Lord sent me here. He says it three times. The Lord sent me here to preserve life. And even at the end of the book, whenever the bro after the death of Jacob and the brothers are afraid, Joseph is, is now going to take his revenge because uh, dad's gone. Uh, Joseph says in, uh, that amazing passage, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to preserve this nation, to preserve this people alive. So, the, uh, the, the, uh, the great theme of God's providence and God's pr preserving his people so that uh, they can grow from this one man and one woman, Abraham and Sarah, with the one son of promise. And that nation, it's not just these, all these others that Abraham fathers, these other tribes that come. It's a nation must come from that line. That, that's the key. A nation must come from that line and become a great multitude. Uh, I'll just uh, mention here, the Holocaust, by all accounts, exterminated at least 6 million Jews. At least. In fact, I've read estimates that it could, that it could have been double that number. That may be a, uh, actually a very conservative estimate. Oh no, I'm not an expert. But at least six million. And when you think of all of the efforts over the centuries to exterminate the Jewish people, Herod and the babies, and uh, the Pharaoh and the midwives, and on and on and on and on, in ancient and modern times, Today, there are 7 million people in Israel. When Carol and I first went to Israel about 30 years ago, actually, more than 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, 
the population of Israel, there were more Jews in New York than there were in Israel. Now there are 7 million, and it's growing. It's one of the fastest growing countries in the world because of all the Jews coming from all over the world. It's just amazing. God has preserved his people, and uh, I mean, they're a small percentage of the world's population, but they have been preserved through systematic efforts to exterminate them. That's what's so amazing. And all this begins in Genesis. So the promise to Isaac is, I will bless you, I, I am with you, and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there, called upon the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. <laughs> There's a well again. <laughs> um, and uh, as was done with uh, Abraham, Isaac uh, and Abimelech make a treaty, enter into a treaty agreement, and the Initiative for this is Abimelech, where he says in verse 28, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. And, and this is another thing that we're going to see in Genesis, and, and in fact all through the Bible, and in our own Christian lives today. The, uh, the evidence, even to pagans, to, un, to unbelievers, people outside the covenant relationship of Israel, who see, as it says here, see plainly that the Lord has been with you. I, I, I know I mentioned in this class this wonderful book that I've been reading by George Gilder, uh, The Israel Test. And uh, that's one of his themes in that book, is that the evidence... You know, it's it's Hotels.com. It's Captain Obvious. <laughs> those are kind of dumb commercials. <laughs> but they're kind of funny. Have you seen those commercials? Hotels.com. Captain Obvious. <laughs> it is kind of funny, you know. Because our reviews are written by real, real people, not people who lie on the internet. <laughs> well, uh, there's something Captain Obvious about... George Gilder says, there's something Captain Obvious about Israel. They are the people of God. And the evidence is overwhelming. Only fools and liars uh, can fail to see that the hand of the supernatural, I don't, I don't think George Gilder is an evangelical Christian, I'm, I'm not I'm sure what he is, but but he says, nobody in there who is a, 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 a sane person can look at Israel and deny that there's something supernatural about this. Someone said that we prove that the Bible is true, so look at the Jews. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Where are the Hittites? Yeah. Where are the uh, Amorites? Uh, where are the Parasites? Yeah. Where are the Jews? Exactly where God said they would be. Oh, man. Okay, well, um, there are there's much more there. Uh, I'll just uh, point to verse 34 because it sets the stage for the uh, following chapters, several chapters. Verse 34 says, When Esau was 40 years old, you remember that's, that's the age Isaac was when uh, Rebekah was brought to him from Mesopotamia, he took Judith, the wife of Be'eri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Even though Isaac played favorites and uh, loved Esau, this was a bitter pill for them. And you know, no doubt, not least because he had married women of the, uh, well, uh, the Hittites who were who lived in, actually the Hittites came from Mesopotamia, most likely, 
but they had filtered south into the land of Palestine, and so they were num they would be numbered among and lived among the Canaanites, and they, in other words, they married outside the faith, or Esau married outside the faith. But of course, it's, Im it's implied that it wasn't just that, although later on that's mentioned specifically that Esau had married outside the faith. Whenever they send Jacob off to uh, Mesopotamia. But at any rate, the stage is set. We now see another evidence of the kind of spiritual dullness of Esau. He didn't care about his birthright. Uh, present, present gratification more important than future blessing. And Is, you wonder if they're referring to they, if Moses is referring to those two wives. Yeah, yeah, or, or to, to all of them. Yeah, and yeah. Was, but again, the, the, they married out of there. Exactly. What a warning. Yeah, us. it really is. Well, verse 27, the, um, and I tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, we're beginning again. We're starting with uh, chapter 27. And this chapter is very well known to us, of course. Uh, Isaac, old eyes dim so that he could not see. And uh, he says, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and bow, go out to the field, hunt game for me, prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Um, Isaac is a long way from dying. <laughs> uh, many years before he dies. Uh, probably 30. But uh, we don't want to be too hard on, on Isaac. After all, it says that his uh, his his eyes were dim, so he couldn't see. So he is apparently uh, either blind or very nearly blind. And, you know, I've, I've thought about this some. You probably have, too. Uh, I wear glasses. I've worn glasses for years and years and years since I was a student. And I'm grateful for them. I hate them, <laughs> but I'm grateful for them. And you think about in the... Uh, in the in older generations, not not so long past, if you started losing your eyesight, that was just it. I mean, there's nothing you could do about it. You just have to just have to live with it. And you know that's kind of a, a fearsome thing to, to uh, think about. <clears throat> so at any rate, without being too hard on Isaac, he wants to bless uh, Esau before he dies. Esau being his firstborn. And right away, we have to stop and ask. Okay, Rebecca certainly had the prophecy that the older was going to serve the younger. Okay, did Isaac not know that? Because Isaac seems to be bent on giving that blessing of uh, primogeniture, that's the technical term, uh, the uh, privileges of firstborn, primogeniture. He seems bent on giving that to Esau. This, of course, is what Jacob did with Joseph's sons. He bestowed on Joseph's sons primogeniture. And among and between his two sons, he bestowed primogeniture on Ephraim, the younger, rather than Manasseh, the older. So it does beg the question, did he not know? You know, we, we've talked about Isaac being a, a spiritual man, but then again, he's human. Uh, did, did he know and think, well, uh, it doesn't matter, or he forgot, or did he not take Rebecca seriously, or maybe Rebecca never told him. I mean, that's hard. It's hard to contemplate that she wouldn't have. But so you know, we could speculate all day about why he was going to take this action. But uh, 
whatever it was, we know that this was not of God. And Rebecca certainly knew this. And that's what makes her part in this story so interesting. Is that she did, in a, in, uh, in a very real way, exactly what Sarah did with Hagar. She took God's will into her own hands. So Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son. And of course we know the story. They uh, concocted this, uh, this ruse. It's kind of amazing. I've read this story a thousand times, you know, and I, uh, I thought, man, they were good because uh, this would not be easy to pull off. And, you know, I think we probably, most of us have the impression that uh, they had these, these skins and such and such. Of course, of course they did, but, uh, I mean, I think we... We think about when we think about a skin, we think about a bear skin rug in the living room. And we just think to ourselves, how in the world could Isaac be deceived by that? And he did question it. But they must have done it so cleverly. And which must have, you know, it, it had to be fairly meticulously done. Because when you lose uh, your eyesight, uh, by all accounts that I have anyway, your other senses are the powers of your other senses are heightened. And uh, I had a man, I actually had an encounter one time with a man who was blind. It was the most interesting encounter I think I've almost ever had in my whole life. And I forget, forgive me that I don't remember all the details of this had been years ago, but, but a friend, a mutual friend said, this man can feel your face and your chest. And he can tell you all kinds of things about you. And he did. <laughs> it's kind of scary. And you know we have in our church Connie Ellis who is who is blind and uh, you know, I've heard Bob and her both talk about the things that, that she picks up their church that we, we would never even think about. Well anyway so uh, all that is just to say, uh, th this was a very clever deception. It had to be carefully planned, and and it had to be pulled off with uh, with a lot of uh, chutzpah. Because if you can't see, and your other senses are heightened. You think he would be listening to them speak. In fact, at one point he says, you know, the uh, the voice is the voice of Jacob. He hears that difference. Um, are you, and later on, of course, uh, there, verse 24, are you really my son Esau? Uh, he, uh, Anyway, uh, Isaac had his questions, but um, he, uh, it still worked. <laughs> so, all, again, all that just to say that it was an incredibly, uh, if, you, if this is the right way to say it, an incredibly well-planned deception to have worked. Because there were several things wrong about it that Esau picked up on. How did you? How did it happen so soon? How did you get the game so soon? And you know, you don't seem quite right. <laughs> the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. But it does work, and uh, you know, in the same way that Abraham has a son by Hagar. Uh, the blessing comes to Jacob uh, by these ungodly means. Uh, of course, the difference there is that uh, Ishmael was not going to be the recipient of the promise, even though they tried to take God's will into their hands. But in this case, it was God's will for Jacob. So, you know, I, I've often I've often asked myself. What if they had not done this? How how would Jacob have, have 
have gotten this blessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other question would be if they had not done this, maybe the blessing then they gave to Esau would have been what it was. I mean, that caused a whole other That's set true. Problems. Yeah, it sure did. That if it had just gone God's way, maybe that would have yeah. been different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, if you'd known it was Jacob, it, it probably would have been different. Although, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's generic in a way, and part of it even repeats the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. Uh, Cursed be everyone who curses you, blessed be everyone who blesses you, but uh, um, let people serve you, nations bow down to you, be lord over your brothers, may your mother's sons may bow down to you. Of course, this is... Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so as soon as, uh, verse 30, as soon as Isaac had finished, when Jacob had scarcely gone out, boy, uh, everything about this had to be, you know, the, the planning, the the uh, storyline, the the, uh, the the shall we say the makeup for <laughs> Jacob, and then the timing because it it all had to be done before Esau came back, and it barely was. I mean, this would make a this would make a drama, you know, worthy of TV, keep you on the edge of your seat to the last moment. And so Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting and he prepared the food, which takes us back to the bowl of stew. When Jacob comes in, I mean, Esau comes in from the field. Why didn't he do that then? Mm -hmm. Yes, had to have it now. And uh, his father Isaac asks, Who are you? Oh boy. And Isaac trembled violently when he heard Esau's answer. So who was it that brought in the, uh, in the game? And, uh, which, by the way, I, I, I can't resist just pointing this out. So many things had to work perfectly. And even, even the food that was prepared, Rebecca had to prepare it in a way that Esau would think it was wild game. Because it wasn't wild game. Wow. So, you know, I've heard of people who, who try to take venison and make it taste like steak. But to, to take steak and make it taste like venison, that's another... <laughs> That's another challenge. <laughs> yeah, get <yeah>, dried out <laughs> and sprinkle some lye on it or something. <laughs> oh man. Um, all right. So Esau, when he realizes what has happened, uh, when his father realizes what has happened, your your brother came deceitfully and he's taken away your blessing, and. Um, Esau says, is he not rightly named Jacob, the one who takes by the heel, the supplanter? For he has cheated me these two times. Never mind that the first time Esau gave it away. And so he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered, uh, I've made him Lord over you. I've given him all this. Uh, Given him the blessing of primogenitor. I've given him the blessings of the firstborn. And so there is no blessing left except, verse uh, 39 and verse 40, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth, the exact opposite of Jacob's, shall your dwelling be, away from the dew of heaven on high. But by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And when you go restless, you shall, uh, when you grow restless. You shall break his yoke from your neck. Uh, by most accounts, the descendants of Esau are the Edomites. And, um, and this describes exactly the Edomites. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which, with which his father had blessed him. And he, uh, he comforts himself, as the scripture says, with the uh, knowledge that the days of uh, mourning are approaching and then when his father is gone. 
I'll kill him. These words came to Rebecca, and uh, she said to him, Your brother comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, uh, arise, plead to Laban. And notice, uh, more deception, even though it's more subtle and maybe a little more reasonable, but in verse 46, she has said to Jacob, Your brother's going to kill you. You've got to get out of town. Get out of Dodge. But when she speaks to Isaac, and maybe both of these were, well, you know the first one was true, and this one no doubt as well. In other words, mixed motives here. But she's, when she speaks to Isaac, she doesn't mention the, uh, the threat of Esau. She only says, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women to whom we were introduced in chapter 26. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like those, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? So Jacob, uh, Isaac calls Jacob and says, you must not take a wife and you cannot arise, go to Padanaram, the exact same place to which the servant of Abraham went. Pad Padanaram. Which describes, by the way, a region of Mesopotamia in the, the north part, the crest of the Fertile Crescent. I've described the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, to the west, Tigris Euphrates, or Euphrates Tigris, Crescent up into what is today northern Syria, southern Turkey, that region, and then down the coast of the Mediterranean, all the way down to the Nile. And the crest of the Fertile Crescent, northern Syria, Aram is a reference to Syria. Padan Aram is, a, is an area of Syria, and it's in that um, well, we know that Abraham and Terah and the family spent time in Haran. There's actually a river called Haran, and there's, and there's a region that is bounded by that river in the Tigris and Euphrates. So that's the area that, that uh, is being described here. So uh, Isaac uh, conforming to the wishes of uh, Rebekah. Which, you know, again, I want to say, I don't want to be too hard on, on them. I don't want to ridicule or mock. They're, they're just very human. But we know that Rebecca's real motive was to protect the life of Jacob, which is, I mean, she's a mom. Uh, you understand that. But she doesn't mention that to Isaac. Now, we have to be careful, you know, arguments and silence uh, aren't worth much, but, but she doesn't mention it to him. And there's no evidence anywhere along the way that Isaac knew this. But maybe he did, but we're not told that. But at any rate, his reasoning, when he speaks to Jacob, has nothing to do with Esau. Zero. You must not take a wife from uh, the Canaanite women. I said that I did Nothing to do with Esau's threat. It has to do with Esau, in that Esau married these Canaanite women, but... Uh, that's all. It's not because of the threat. So, may the blessing of Abraham to you and your offspring, uh, or may he, God, give the blessing of Abraham to you and your offspring, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. And Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So we have no doubt where he was going exactly to the same place where um, Rebecca herself had been born and, grown, and had grown up. Well, okay. Um, the scene uh, shifts just a bit. There's a little, uh, there's a brief little remark about Esau who uh, marries an Ishmaelite. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away and, uh, and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his own. So uh, Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father. Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the other wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael. This is a very interesting passage. Uh, a little compunction on the part of Esau. For whatever reason, we, you know, we can't we can't psychoanalyze him, we don't know exactly, but it says specifically that when he saw that it displeased 
Isaac and Rebekah that he had taken the Canaanites and that Jacob had been sent away precisely for that reason, to avoid that, he marries within the family. Now, he doesn't go to Padan Aram, but uh, he does marry a descendant of Abraham by way of Ishmael. You know, uh, years ago, I used to, when I was young and immature and hadn't really thought on these things, I used to think that uh, Esau was thumbing his nose at um, Isaac and Rebekah. And now I've come to see, no, it was the exact opposite. He wasn't thumbing his nose. He was apparently trying to make some kind of amends. He was he was trying to get back in their good graces. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see this time and again. We've already seen it. The, uh, the mixed motivations that people have and the uh, and, and the mixture of the good with the bad and the bad with the good, uh, Esau, spiritually dull, no apparent concern for the things of God, uh, the, the real blessings of God, not realizing what he's got until it's lost. And then with the, um, and then with the women, uh, the, the wives realizing that this had offended his parents gravely. Um, he takes wives from Abraham's descendants, uh, apparently a way to, to somehow get back in the good graces. And then, you know, years later, more than more than twenty years later, <clears throat> when Jacob and Esau meet, Jacob is terrified. He thinks, okay, Esau is going to take his revenge, even though Isaac is still alive at that point. And then when he meets Esau, it's completely different than he expected. Nothing like what he expected. And at the end, when Isaac does die, the scripture says specifically that Jacob and Esau came together and buried their father. It's a, it's a remarkable story. It really is. So uh, Esau, he's never a hero. He's a, but he's not exactly a villain either. In some ways, he's a victim. Of deception. In some ways, he's just uh, spiritually weak. But uh, at other times, we see him trying to do the right thing, apparently. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, Jacob's famous dream at Bethel, which he names Bethel. Of course, Bethel becomes a very important place all through the history of Israel. It's just north of Jerusalem. And it was, it became, whenever the kingdom divided, it became the southern border of uh, the northern kingdom. Israel is described as Dan to Bethel, I mean, uh, Dan to Beersheba. But when the kingdoms divided, the northern kingdom is described as the land from Dan to Bethel. And Bethel is just north, not very far north of Jerusalem. In a car, it's 15 minutes, so... Uh, <laughs> Or less. But at any rate, it was called Bethel because of Jacob's experience there. He, uh, he leaves Beersheba, journeys toward Haran, and evidently following the spine or the ridge of Israel. I, I mentioned this before, the topography of Israel is on the east, you have... Uh, the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea Valley, and then I mean, that's a deep, deep valley rift. And then on further to the east, you have the mountains of Gilead, Jordan, what is today Jordan. And, but the, in the ancient world, Ammon, I mean the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, from north to south. But it's a high ridge, so you have mountains on both sides of the great rift valley. Then you have the ridge itself, where Jerusalem is, and Hebron, and Bethlehem, and the highlands to the north, uh, the hill country they call it. And then to the west, you have the plains of Sharon. And uh, that's where the Philistines were, and so forth and so on. And But it's a, a fairly wide plain. You, you come out of, you leave Jerusalem, and you go down, 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 like you go into the airport, you down, 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 down. Uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, down, 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 
and then suddenly you're in the plain, the valley of Sharon, or, or the plain of Sharon, and as far as you can see, it's flat as this table, and extremely productive, very fruitful, all kinds of, of everything, everything, and of course, the airport, <laughs> and Tel Aviv, now Tel Aviv. Uh, by the way, in, those, in ancient times, there was no Tel Aviv, there was nothing there, because it was a swamp, and the... Uh, uh, Israelis drained it when they began to come back into the land and built the city there. So it's a new city. It's not an old city. The closest to it is uh, Joppa. Or now they call it Yafo. And, uh, but it's ju that's just to the south of uh, Tel Aviv. Okay. So Bethel is in that uh, hill country just to the north of Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem is all hills. It's built on seven hills like Rome. But just to the north is uh, Bethel. And that's where he uh, winds up. It, it's a fair distance from Beersheba to Bethel. If you're walking. It's, uh, this is, um, well, let's see, probably somewhere in the order of five days-ish. Uh, maybe not quite that long. You can make, you know, walking, you can make 25 to 35 miles a day depending on the terrain. And if you, you know, keep at it. And so using those rough figures, it's, you know, probably a three to four day journey. So he uh, lies down for the evening and uh, sees the ladder, the angels of God ascending and descending. The Lord uses this, uh, as you know, in John chapter 1. The Lord refers to this in a very interesting way with the call of Nathaniel, who is probably also Bartholomew, the disciple. Probably one of the same, Nathaniel and Bartholomew. But uh, uh, Nathaniel is the one who, when he's told that we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, his response is, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Come and see and he does come and see. And as he's approaching Jesus, Jesus says to him, Behold, an Israelite. Remember, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. An Israelite in whom there is no guile. No deception. Jacob's whole life is deception. <laughs> That's a fascinating passage. And... Um, of course, Jesus says to Nathaniel, and I've started this, i got to finish it, i got to catch the rabbit, but um, um, yeah, 47, and Nathaniel answered, how do you know me? Verse 48, Jesus answered, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And speculation is that Nathaniel was reading scripture or maybe meditating on scripture under the fig tree and he was thinking about this very passage in Genesis. Abraham, I mean, uh, Jacob is fleeing for his life because of his deception. He is an Israelite in whom there is guile. And uh, Jesus uh, what he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. An amazing testimony at first meeting. And Jesus said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending. That's why many think that this was a passage on which Nathaniel might have been meditating the dream of Jacob and the ladder of the angels of God ascending and descending. Uh, a symbol, obviously, of, <coughs> of uh, relationship between God and man. And so, Jacob has this dream and the vision, and when he awakens, verse 16 of chapter 28, he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other 
than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So uh, early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had had under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it and named the place Bethel, Beit House El, of course, God. But the name of the city was Lutz at the first. We'll come across that name a few times later on in the Old Testament. And uh, Jacob made a vow, and and we're going to see how important this becomes in chapter 35 after the uh, Dinah story, that uh, Jacob makes a promise. He says, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, and the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will give a tenth to you. So Jacob makes a vow that... Uh, um, will be, uh, will, how should I say this, will be due, so to say, uh, if he comes back to this place. And in chapter 35, God commands him to go back to this place. And a very interesting, uh, not just the command itself, but then what Jacob does in response to the command in chapter 35. All right, so uh, Jacob comes to Padanaram, and here again, we know this story very well. I don't need to repeat it. This more deception. Jacob, the deceiver, is deceived. And, you know, I used to wonder years ago, how in the world could you marry and have a wedding night and not know? <laughs> well, that's not really that unusual in the ancient world because uh, women were veiled. And, yeah, and, uh, well, we don't need to go into all this, the details, but uh, it really is not that different, actually, at all, in the ancient world. And so Jacob serves the seven years for Rebecca, I mean for Rachel, and winds up being given Leah because it's not our custom to marry off the younger before the older. And uh, so... Again, now Jacob is required to serve another seven years, although evidently he is allowed to marry uh, Rachel right away or after his time for Leah has been granted. So evidently he gets them both in, in fairly short order, but he has to work another seven years. So now we're at 14 years. And, of course, the children begin to be born, uh, by now, a fairly familiar story, Rachel can't have children. The favored wife can't have children, but Leah can, and she's uh, very fruitful. This, uh, you know, I know it's getting ahead, but because, you know, our time is going to drift away from us, it, the more gaps we can fill in, the better. This helps to explain the, uh, the blessing of Jacob on Joseph. Uh, and why? It's kind of perplexing. If, when you read that passage, it's in Genesis 48, um, you kind of scratch your head a little bit because, you know, what it says in chapter 48 is uh, let me find it here. is that uh, uh, Jacob is uh, giving to Joseph uh, and by way of his sons, he is giving them the privilege of the firstborn. He is making them the firstborn. Um I don't want to read the whole thing. Um, um, Let's see.
Okay. In um, verse 5 of chapter 48, he says, And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to in Egypt are mine. So he adopts them. Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. Um, and the children that you father after them shall be yours. So he had, Jacob adopts Ephraim and Manasseh as his own. And this prepares the way for Joshua. And what we read there, and, and uh, answers the questions we might have. Well, if the land was divided, allotted to the tribes, how is it that Ephraim and Manasseh, who weren't sons of Jacob, how did they get allotments of land? Well, because they were sons of Jacob, by adoption. So, th there's no inheritance for Joseph. He's not one of the tribes to whom land is allotted. It's Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons. Um, well, the um, the emphasis here falls on Jacob's making Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, not just equal with, but apparently even above Reuben and Simeon. And the explanation for that would seem to be that Jacob's intention was to marry Rachel first. And he was tricked into marrying Leah first, and Rachel second. Of course, as it turned out, Rachel couldn't have children. But what Jacob seems to be doing here is to be putting Ephraim and Manasseh in the position they would have had if she had been his first wife, and if she had had children in the normal way. So it didn't work that way, but now Jacob adopts these two sons. And then says, very interestingly, other sons you may have, Joseph, and Joseph probably did have other sons. They're yours. That's a different line. That's not part of this line. It's, all, it's very fascinating. And, uh, but of course, uh, when it comes to the division of the land, you have Ephraim and Manasseh getting allotments even though they weren't the birth sons of Jacob. And then, of course, Levi doesn't get an allotment of land because the, uh, the inheritance of the Levites is the Lord. So this accounts for the 12 tribes and the 12 allotments. Wow. It's all very interesting stuff. Um, okay, back to chapter... Where are we? Chapter 20... Eight. Good. In, yes. in a real way, Joseph got two parts. Mm -hmm. Joseph, in a real way, yeah, he did. Got two yeah. parts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's why we say that even though it's kind of uh, it's given to us sort of indirectly in Genesis 48, the sons of Joseph get uh, the privilege of of the firstborn, mm -hmm. they they are they are essentially taking the place of Reuben and Simeon, mm -hmm. and of course, Reuben and Simeon send their way out of uh, their rights. Reuben, because he defiled his father's couch, we're told. Uh, that's another story. When we get to it, if we have time, we'll mention it. And Simeon, of course, but well, we won't talk about Simeon just yet. We'll save that. We know why Simeon. But, uh, okay, so Jacob marries Leah, Rachel. The children are born. Uh, this takes us down to, oh, chapter 30, 
we, we move ahead very, very quickly. And uh, we, uh, the, the sons are all born now. And verse 25 of chapter 30, as soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and country. Give me my wives, my children, and so forth. But Laban said to him, if I have found favor, um, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. That's a very interesting thing to say. Name your wages, I will give it. Jacob said to him, uh, I'm going to close with this. We'll take a break after this, but uh, let, let me deal with this uh, kind of problem passage here, which has been much disputed and much misunderstood in my judgment. Let me deal with this, uh, chapter 30, and then we'll take a break for a few minutes. And uh, so uh, Laban proposes, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, well, he does propose in a way. He, he proposes that uh, Jacob name his wages so that they can prepare to separate here. Uh, in other words, what will be a fair settlement? We're going we're to divide the estate and take out Jacob's part of it so that uh, Jacob can go now and establish his own household. That's, that's what lies behind all this. So Jacob says, You know yourself how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me. You had little before I came, and it has increased abundantly, and the Lord has blessed you. So Jacob can, can point to his record. Uh, I've been a great help to you economically. But now, how, when shall I provide for my own household? So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob says, uh, that's Laban talking, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this, I will pass to your flock and keep it. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And this is going to go on for about six years, by the way. So it doesn't happen overnight. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later. Because you can tell. I, I, I will not have stolen anything because the colors, the, the, the inferior, by the way, colors and markings of the sheep will speak for me. Pure white wool is is the most valuable of all. Pure black is less valuable, inferior, and the spotted, speckled, marked, all those uh, kinds of skins, uh, much inferior. Not that they don't make a good meal, <laughs> the goats and the lambs, but uh, in terms of the wool, not nearly as valuable. So Jacob proposes a very reasonable test. I'll keep the flocks, and you can test my honesty. Uh, what you know, the white lambs, goats are yours, pure and simple. And this is where the uh, the problem passage comes in. Verse thirty seven says, Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar, and almond, and plane trees, and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks so that uh, that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And the uh, flocks brought four stripes, speckled and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs, set the faces of the flocks toward the stripe, and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart, did not put them with Laban's. Whenever the stronger the flock uh, were breeding, he would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. But for the fever of the flock, he would not lay them there, so the fever would be Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female male servants, camels and donkeys. Okay. Uh, this is a very complicated passage. And there's been so much discussion of this. Almost every commentary on Genesis that I know, and i got a bunch of them, almost every single one that I know, say something like this, that it was believed in the ancient world that the offspring of uh, animals, 
and even humans for that matter, but, uh, but especially with regard to animals, the offspring would be in some way influenced by experiences during the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the pregnancy of the animal uh, before or during. And so then the commentators go on to say that was an ancient belief, and Jacob believed that. But in this case, uh, God honored it. I mean, there's nothing to it genetically, but God, uh, God honored it. So it was a sign of God's grace and favor on Jacob. And that what he did was he peeled these uh, sticks of different kinds of trees and just laid them in front of the flock so that when they were mating uh, during the... Uh, during the mating season, and they did that at the uh, at the watering places. That they that seeing these things, they would bring forth lambs and uh, kids that had these different markings. Well, uh, if that were true, I uh, I wouldn't have too much trouble with it. After all, Scripture does tell us that. Uh, that God does this sometimes. He He, he uh, shows His grace by allowing even pagan practices to uh, uh, to be blessed. For example, you know, I think one of the greatest examples of this is the Magi, who come to uh, worship the King of the Jews. the The Magi. We know who the Magi were. We know exactly who they were. Herodotus, the Greek historian, tells us about it. He has a couple of, he mentions them three or four times. And he tells us exactly who they were. They were astrologers. They, uh, they were pagans, although they had probably learned of the expectation of the Jewish Messiah uh, indirectly from Daniel years before. And, um, but they had read the stars. I just read recently that, uh, that uh, a retired professor of astronomy at Rutgers has, uh, given, has, has just recently set forth a theory about what it was they saw. They saw uh, an oculation of the moon in the house of Aries. And we know when that occurred, and the timing is about right. Other scholars have said that they saw the rising of the, the dog star, Sirius, on a certain month uh, or day of the month, which uh, maybe might have had some symbolic implications. There's a book written about that. Uh, let me just tell you, for what it's worth, uh, on this I would, I would uh, go to the mat. They did not see a bright shining object in the sky, but they followed to Bethlehem. That's not what the Greek text says. That is not what it says. Okay? I'm going to explain. In Greek, if you want to say east, and remember what the wise men, according to in the King James Version, says, we have seen the star in the east. In the modern translations, it doesn't say that. Most modern translations will say, we have saw the star in its rising. And that's because uh, there, uh, there's a phrase that would be used to say in the East, it's in taste anatoles. Anatole is East. That, that, if you want to say the East as a direction, you would say anatole. Uh, but if, you, if you're going to say we saw his star in the East, in that region, you would say in Tase anatoles. That's not what the Greek text says. The Greek says in te anatole. And that's different. That phrase means rising, in its rising, in the rising. It doesn't mean in the direction of the east, it means in the rising. So it, it refers to some kind of celestial phenomenon that they saw and that they interpreted as pointing to the birth of the Jewish king. 
So there were a lot of factors that conspired to bring the Magi, but uh, um, they, they didn't follow a star. They saw a star, and, and the Greek word for star is austere, from which we get astrology, austere. And so, um, did they see an occultation of the moon in front of Jupiter in the house of Aries? Well, okay, that's a recent theory. I'm more inclined to the serious uh, dog star theory because uh, that's a star. And the dog star rose with the sun on the same day of a month for four years in a row. And it happened at the time frame that... Uh, would account for the birth of Jesus. So, anyway, uh, all I'm saying there is, by getting back to Genesis, <laughs> let's try to get back to Genesis, there was a case where God honored basically pagan thinking and ritual practices to uh, confront with a witness his own people. God brings these astrologers from Persia to Jerusalem asking the Jews about the birth of their own Messiah. It's an astounding uh, development. But God led them there through their own pagan means. Well, uh, the blessing of God on the Philistines when they send the Ark of the Covenant back. They, uh, they do divinations and they consult the oracles and such and they say, this is what you should do. And God blessed it. When David tried to do the same thing, God cursed it. Okay, so back to the story of the sheep and Jacob. If that's what happened, well, we have some precedent for it in Scripture, and that wouldn't be hard to swallow, but I don't think it is what happened. And part of the reason for that is the practice of Jacob himself. Jacob didn't know uh, Gregor Mendel's laws of, of uh, genetics, but he was an experienced shepherd, a very experienced shepherd. And by the way, uh, down there in Utah, uh, at least uh, one or two of our students are uh, shepherds themselves. So they could probably teach this uh, better than I can. But uh, there are evidences in the text that Jacob knew full well that uh, there was something heredity, her hereditary about the, the offspring of the... <coughs> of the... Uh, lambs and goats, for example, he uh, put the sticks in front of the stronger, recognizing that stronger ewes and female goats would produce stronger kids and lambs. Well, that's hereditary. He knew that. And, uh, and he also separated Laban's flock from his own. This is a way of increasing the odds of producing the mottled, speckled, colored lambs and kids rather than the white ones, of separating the flocks. Well, um, there's evidence, too, that Laban knew this because it says that whenever Jacob proposed the wages, that uh, Laban said, good, this is verse 34, let it be as you've said. But that day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted. Laban knew that striped and spotted goats and lambs would produce striped and spotted, or more likely to produce striped and spotted. So he removed them. He took them. He, he, he robbed Jacob right off the bat. Now, he probably left some. You know, Chances are he didn't get all of them. <clears throat> so Jacob is left with uh, a primarily now, a primarily white flock of goats and lambs, or sheep, and probably a few, just a few, of the speckled and spotted. So what does Jacob do here? Well, 
there are a couple of theories. One theory is, I mean, besides the theory that he was just superstitious, which I don't believe was the case. There's too much evidence that he wasn't superstitious, that he knew the laws, something about the laws of heredity. So there are two basic theories. One theory is that these sticks, and, and by the way, let me, let me just stop right here and say that uh, the Hebrew language here, um, I, I know, you know, we have an English translation. We have to remember this is in, it's written in Hebrew, and the Hebrew here is very difficult. All the Hebrew scholars acknowledge that. And, um, you know, translation is, is part art and part science. And there's evidence that the translation here has been influenced by the idea that Jacob was superstitious. There are other ways to translate these words. In fact, better ways. But anyway, there are two theories uh, that, that I've been able to track down. One theory which to me doesn't make quite as much sense. But one theory is that the sticks, the wood that Jacob uh, is referred to here, were actually pins. Pins. P-E-N-S. Uh, sheep pins. To separate the flocks. So that as the speckled and mottled and such were born, he separated them out in these pins to ensure that uh, they produce more. He put the stronger ones there together and such and such and such. I don't think that makes as much sense because um, th there's no indication that he was using these to build anything. And that's, that's kind of where this theory seems to fall to the ground is that the sticks were being used for some other purpose. There's absolutely no reference to building whatsoever which doesn't quite fit if he was just building pins to separate the flocks. Although it does say he separated them, but the sticks don't enter into that. Here's the other theory, and it comes from uh, a professor at the University of Washington who is a, he's a, he's a, an authority on uh, Near Eastern languages and culture. And uh, to me it makes sense, although our shepherds in Utah... Uh, well, I'm not sure this practice holds anymore, but uh, but uh, what he says is that, uh, and he says this was a common practice in the ancient world, to use sticks as a kind of, um, I, don't, I certainly don't want to be delicate here, but as a, uh, uh, as a kind of false, mating device when the ewes and the female goats are in estrus to um, to select their breeding patterns by using sticks to replace the male organ. I don't want to be a delicate, but we're talking animals here and uh, it's pretty graphic stuff. And that makes sense. And, and he points out that uh, if you take the Hebrew and just set aside for a moment the English translations and just take the Hebrew, that fits the Hebrew language. So that the reason for the sticks and exposing these sticks was not so that the lambs, I mean the sheep and the goats would simply look at them and somehow in this superstition be influenced to produce these animals. But that it was a way of preventing mating with the wrong kind of sheep or goat, namely a white one. And that would explain also why the sticks were put before them or around them when uh, uh, among the stronger ones and not the weaker ones. Now again, it's a hard passage. It's a, it's a very difficult passage to translate and there's so many things involved here 
but uh, I just got to tell you, I've read that theory and tried to digest it, and to me it makes the most sense that Jacob is an experienced shepherd and uh, uh, and knows the behavior and knows how the sheep and goats behave in their heat, and he manipulates the breeding process so that the ones that produce the most or mate the most are the stronger ones and the colored ones. It makes sense. So it was a superstition. I don't think it was superstition. I think it was uh, experience and uh, brilliance. And it worked because uh, verse uh, chapter 31, Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our fathers very skillfully. Today, we can actually we call that uh, synchronized breeding, mm-hmm. as well as making use of hybrid vigor. Yeah. And that's, that's what he was doing. Did you really? So you know about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I moved from over there to here. Okay. Yeah, you, got, you. So you should have been teaching this. I, no, no, I don't know anything about shepherding except what I've read. So. But go back to. No. Go back to that verse where it's the David said that I found babies. I I learned by divination. Yeah. And I know that the Lord says in this word that divination is sin. Yeah. Would this be an, another case? Because what he learned. Was true. Was true. Was, was absolutely true. Yeah. So, did, is this another case of God using? Yeah, it could be. That, that yeah. thing. Yeah. Even though I mean, Laban. He can use what he wants. He's an idiot, exactly. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think it could be because Laban was clearly a, at best, he was a compromiser. Yeah. Laban was a bad dude. I, <laughs> I don't like Laban very much at all. I but, have uh, a question that maybe you don't want to hear. Yeah. You know what? Let, why don't we take a break right there? We're going to stop. Astrology, but astronomy is a craft or a science. Science. Mm-hmm. And um, we're, you know, we're back online here normal. for our students down in Utah, and we're just having a little discussion about divination and uh, in, in inviting you to join us uh, in doing some divination. Uh, not serious, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying about so astronomy. The, the Magi, um, uh, we had used the word divination in talking about how they arrived at that there was an object in the sky and they were following it and so forth. Right. But, uh, but it was a craft. Astronomy is a craft of science. Science. And um, putting together the normal patterns in the sky and knowing there was something abnormal along with studying religions of the area of the time Mm -hmm. and they had read this and now here comes this odd thing in the sky that coincides with the prophecy Mm -hmm. of this Hebrew Messiah Mm -hmm. so so it looks more like um, an observation a scientific observation because of their studies because of their well, except that uh, you wouldn't really call them astronomers, although in the ancient world, astronomy and astrology were often mixed. And in fact, it's you know, almost impossible to separate in the ancient world. So they, they were astrologers. They were looking, um, they knew a lot about astronomy, but they were looking for signs, and they believed that the movements of heavenly bodies and positions of the bodies themselves had some kind of spiritual significance. And they were messages, even. And so that, that's why we say, uh, I mean, that, that would be a form of divination. They were seeking, to, they were using physical uh, phenomena to, do, do, uh, to discern or, yeah, to discern some kind of spiritual uh, message or supernatural message. And so in their case, it was probably a mix, most likely because of the influence of Daniel in Persia. 
uh, they, they knew about the coming Messiah. Of course, Daniel is the great prophet of the Messiah. And he was the chief of the wise men, it says, in Daniel. He was the chief of the wise men. And that included uh, Magi as well as others. There were others. The, Ma the Magi were a certain uh, class of the wise, wise men of the Persia. But Daniel was one of them, and the chief of them. Now this is, of course, 500 years later. Mm -hmm. So a long, long time. And by this time, Persia had given way to Greece, and Greece had given way to Rome. But there was still a great uh, tradition among the uh, peoples of Persia. And, and, and the Magi were not originally from Persia. They were originally from the kingdom of the Medes. And the, the Medes and the Persians came together under Cyrus, the Medo-Persian Empire. And, and, the, and the Magi were a kind of a caste of the Medes that always, from the earliest times we know of the Magi, they were always influential in the royal court. And uh, they were typically kingmakers. They were... They were whether formally or informally, they were the ones who uh, uh, established kings in place or removed kings. They were kingmakers. Mm -hmm. And so, even though they probably weren't functioning that way at the, at the time, that was their history. And so when they come and they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? This was a very disturbing thing for Herod to hear. Of course, Herod was paranoid in the first place, could not bear the thought that there might be any threat to his power. And he killed his own wives and his own sons. He was uh, he was a megalomaniac and, and a paranoid schizophrenic, probably. And he died of a sexually transmitted disease. Most likely, <coughs> most likely. But, uh, anyway, he was he was a uh, but one of the greatest builders and leaders uh, the world ever saw. He was absolutely amazing. There's a very interesting book written by Gospel Yep, Gospel Charles. I had it. Yeah, it's a great book. And nowadays they're talking about the blues right now. Well, okay, let's uh, let's turn in Genesis to <coughs> excuse me to uh, back to chapter thirty-one, where. <coughs> The, uh, we, we really begin a, a whole new section here that culminates, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry, that uh, culminates in chapter 35, um, or you might even say, yeah, add to that chapter 36, and we'll see why uh, if we get there today. I'm not sure that we will. And by the way, for those in uh, Utah, we are going to extend the class. We're going to have another one on Monday, and we will record that, God willing, and, and put that on YouTube as well. We trust this one makes it. But uh, so, really, from chapter 31 to 35 <coughs> or 36, we have the story of Jacob's return. Jacob back to Bethel, back to the land. And the circumstances of that, and how it happened, and uh, this is a, this is a very important section of Genesis, not least because it represents a real change point in Jacob's own life. <coughs> this is where, uh, of course, Jacob becomes Israel. The name is changed, which has uh, very high spiritual significance, and it's his name is changed. Uh, partly because Jacob himself has changed. Well, I just read the beginning of chapter 31 where the sons of Jacob, and Jacob hears about this, I mean the sons of Laban, are saying that Jacob, uh, just as he and his mom managed to steal the blessing very cleverly and apparently uh, very skillfully, Jacob has done the same thing with Laban. Nothing illegal. He kept to his word. Uh, in the case of the stolen blessing, it was, uh, you might say, illegal. <laughs> if legal is the right language. But 
in this case, nothing illegal. He kept strictly to his bargain. He, did, he, he uh, kept true to the letter of the law. Not the spirit, for sure, but the letter. And he did it masterfully. And he enriched himself at Laban's expense. Of course, uh, never mind that Laban had enriched himself for, 20, for 15 years at Jacob's expense. So, you know, a little, little payback here, to put it in colloquial terms. So, uh, very interesting how Jacob uh, goes about planning the, uh, the departure. Uh, even though he had made an agreement with Laban to separate, and Laban had, had agreed to all this, uh, apparently the, the word he's hearing from the sons leads him to believe that uh, this isn't going to happen peacefully. So, verse 2 says, he saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before, no doubt because of this, the... the uh, the sons and their talk. And then the Lord said to Jacob, and here again, we see this time and time again, how God uses certain circumstances to uh, indicate his will. And, you know, you almost get the idea here, Jacob was going to have to leave. There, there was no way he was going to be able to stay here. But this is also God's will. Um, you know, I know some, sometimes people, sometimes Christians are troubled by the idea that circumstances kind of, you know, paint you in a corner or something, and, and, and maybe they'll even question, well, is this really God's will? Well, one of the ways God has to show us his will is by painting us in a corner. And that seems to be the case here. So Jacob, another very interesting thing about this passage <laughs> is that Jacob confers with Rachel and Leah. And, of course, this is a patriarchal society, to be sure. Jacob is the head of the, of the clan, and he could certainly simply say, we're going, and that would be that. But it is interesting that he consults with Rachel and Leah. And... Um, he said to them, yeah, and he does it in the field where his flock was, evidently uh, so as to be separated from Laban, so there's no danger this is overheard or anything. And I see that your father does, does not regard me with favor as he did before, but God has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. He's cheated me, changed my wages ten times, whether he actually was exactly ten or whether this is... a uh, uh, just a way of emphasizing that it's been frequent. But God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, the spotted shall be your wages, the uh, flock more spotted, so forth and so on. Um, by the way, this is, one, this is a passage, uh, those who think that Jacob was simply kind of uh, following the superstitions of the, of the age that experiences before or during the pregnancy of an animal would, would somehow affect the, uh, the offspring, they will point to this passage and they will say, well, God overruled here. And, uh, and that's why I say, if I learn for sure, absolutely, that that was the case, well, I, I could accept that. I, I, I just don't think it quite fits all the evidence, but... Uh, Anyway, the, the important thing here is that, that Jacob is giving honor to whom honor is due. He's giving honor to God as the one who protected him through all of these changes and threats and, uh, and uh, dishonesty. So God has taken away the livestock of your father, given them to me. Um, and he, he does say here that, he's, that he had a dream, and that in that dream, God uh, showed him that uh, that uh, he was going to have uh, have success with, in this agreement that he had made. And then, uh, very interestingly, in verse thirteen, the mention of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel. 
and Jacob's vow had been, God will protect me and watch over me and bring me back to this place. And uh, where, there you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. It's not said in so many words, but the implication is, go back to Bethel. This is what you vowed. You said, if the Lord brings me back to this place, go back to Bethel. And as we know, as we learn, very quickly, he doesn't do that. And Lily's going to tell us all about that. <laughs> okay. Apparently, apparently, even though it was a patriarchal society, Rachel and Leah were going to inherit, besides the brothers. Mm -hmm. and it says, it yeah. It's probably why he... That could have been part of the reason why. Yeah, although they don't wait around for the inheritance, they just leave. Yeah, yeah it could have been. Well, they see their inheritance. Yeah, yeah, and they say that. Yeah, and it's going to their side. Yeah, is there any portion or inheritance left to us? Yeah. And are we not regarded by him as foreigners, for he has sold us and has indeed devoured our money? He's, he spent the inheritance, like the bumper sticker that says, "I'm spending my child's inheritance." So. Yeah. And um, so their conclusion is, now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So um, we know the story. They, they prepared to leave. And he, um, he divided, again, strategically. This is sound thinking. You, uh, you divide the enemy and conquer. <laughs> but uh, here you divide to protect yourself. So you don't have all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. You don't have... Uh... I was just reading. Uh, I got... Uh, I, I don't usually read forwarded things, but yesterday a friend sent uh, forwarded a thing about how God was in Pearl Harbor. And, of course, Sunday is Pearl Harbor Day. And uh, uh, it was... a, a the um, Whoever wrote this was talking about Admiral Nimitz who uh, was sent to Pearl Harbor immediately uh, in the immediate aftermath of it. And he assessed the situation, and Admiral Nimitz, according to this blog or whatever this was, uh, Admiral Nimitz himself says, God protect us. And one of the ways he protected, uh, he said, was that less than five miles away from Pearl Harbor were all the fuel stores. And the Japanese failed to blow up the fuel stores. If they had done that, then all those ships that escaped, and there were a number, could not have, or couldn't have gone very far, they didn't destroy the dry docks. They were so focused, laser focused on the battleships. They saw the battleships lined up in a row, and they attacked the battleships. Far more important than the ships were the dry docks. That's where the ships were repaired. Exactly. And so as it was, they sank in shallow water, they were, because they had the dry dock facilities all intact, they were able to raise them all, repair them, and send them out. And he's, he mentioned several different things that uh, were just, you know, from a strategic point of view, were obvious. But the reason I mentioned it was that uh, uh, Jacob knew not to have everything together, because if he's attacked, then uh, everything is destroyed, whereas... This way, at least, he, he allows himself some uh, possibility of saving some part of his goods. So, he drove away all his livestock, his property, the gain, so, such and such, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, so he, uh, he uh, picked the right moment. When Laban and, his, and presumably his sons would be uh, and, and servants would be away, and then Rachel stole her father's household gods, the the, uh, the now famous teraphim, and Jacob tricked, <laughs> uh, as is his wont, he tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee, and he fled with all that he had rose and crossed the Euphrates, the great river, of course, and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. Gilead is to the east of the Jordan Valley, so it tells us the direction he was coming. 
whenever we take groups to Israel, our guide uh, often points out a place in the Jordan Valley where travelers from Mesopotamia would often cross. So they would come in the highlands to the east of uh, Mount Hermon and down the highlands of Gilead. And then, uh, and their roads today, I mean, highways follow the same route. They would descend down into the Jordan Valley and cross the Jordan River and then, of course, they'd be into Israel. But uh, <clears throat> same, same basic travel patterns today. So he uh, comes in from the east, as I said. It was told Laban on the third day that Laban had fled, and he took his kinsmen and pursued him for seven days. So Jacob had a big head start, and it was three days before Laban even got the word. By the time he got his folks together, it was probably another day or so. So it took him seven days to catch up. It took him a full week. Uh, but God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream by night. Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. So Jacob, Laban is warned in a dream. He overtakes him. We know uh, something of this story. Why have you done this? Uh, so forth and so forth and so on. And uh, Jacob answers, I was afraid, verse 31. For I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. And... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And um, of course, uh, Laban has Laban mentions the the uh, household gods that have been stolen, and Jacob obviously is innocent of this. He doesn't know anything about it, obviously, because he says, "Anyone with whom you find your god shall not live." Even though Rachel, his favored wife, is the one. <coughs> That's like the. Uh... A rash statement, really, because what happened, uh, forget, many hundreds of years later, when the, uh, the, the general or somebody makes a vow and first person out the oh, house Jephthah. is gone. Yeah, Jephthah. Jephthah. Yeah, Jephthah. Jephthah's and, rash vow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah could, could this could have this could have bit him on the nose. Uh, yeah. So Jacob became angry and berated Laban, and what is my offense, what is my sin? They have a rather heated exchange. Verse 38, this is how we put the chronology all together. Uh, he served for the wives 14 years. We're not sure how long exactly uh, elapsed before the deal was made, but quite possibly fairly soon after the 14 years. But he says here, for these 20 years I've been with you. Yeah, verse 38. Yeah, verse 38. Your ewes and female goats have not miscarried. And he he uh, reminds Laban of uh, you know the, the kind of service he gave, even though he was basically an indentured servant. But he he served faithfully these twenty years. Again, he says in verse forty one, "I've been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your daughters, and the uh, six years for your flock. And you changed my wages ten times." Um, and if God had not been with me. Surely you would have sent me away empty-handed, but God saw the affliction and labor and uh, rebuked you last night. So they they agreed to part. Uh, we wouldn't say on friendly terms, but at least agreeing to uh, to coexist, not to attack one another, to uh, to bury the hatchet. I guess would be. Uh, close symbol. So uh, Laban realizes, uh, he's been warned of course, and he realizes that not really much he can do about this in any case. So he says, come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So they put the pillar, uh, built a pillar, and uh, Laban called it Jegar Shahadutha. It's uh, evidently uh, Aramaic, the, the native language of uh, that part of Mesopotamia. And uh, Jacob, called, Jacob called it Galaid, which is uh, just the same, same thing in Hebrew. And uh, so... Uh, 
Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, he named it uh, Dalaid and Mitzpah, which means a watch post or something of that sort. And uh, for he said, the Lord watched between you and me. And uh, when we were out of one another's sight. Sometimes uh, I've, I've heard that verse referred to as a kind of benediction. The Lord watched between you and me when we're out of one another's sight. And that sounds, you know, while we're apart. Maybe. But actually, <laughs> yeah, it's not that at all. It's not a benediction at all. It's a, it's a kind of a warning. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, the Lord, the Lord will be watching you. I won't be able to see you, but the Lord will. Yeah, it's it's a little bit threatening, and it's certainly not a benediction. I find it interesting too. You said you won't marry any other women other yeah. than the nineteen yeah. dollars that you yeah. already have. Exactly. Yeah, that yeah. is interesting because we obviously see that. The tenor of the times was such yeah. that they could yeah, that, go on the other way. Exactly. It's just fascinating. Where is that? Yeah. Yeah. And if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, God is with us. God can see it. Yeah. Well, okay. So they uh, they made this agreement. They, they did kind of bury the hatchet. They 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 do part again. You couldn't say on friendly terms, but at least uh, not as not as bitter enemies. Um, amicable, maybe. Uh, agree to disagree. Yeah, we agree to disagree. We agree to separate. Uh, it's better that we're separated yeah, rather than. <laughs> yeah. Um, and verse fifty-five. Early in the morning, Laban arose and kissed his grandchildren. Kind of a touching scene, knowing that he's never going to see them again. And his daughters and blessed them. And Laban departed and returned home. And that's the end of that part of the story. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I wanted um, to get to Lily's presentation today, and that would be a that probably a good place for us to end. But I, I, I don't want to rush, rush, rush. But um, Maybe, uh, you know, 32 and 33 really go together because um, 32 begins with the, the word reaching Jacob that Esau is coming. And, you know, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm like most everybody else. When, when somebody says to me, you know, I'd like to meet with you, and they don't tell you what it's about. And your mind just races, okay, what in the world? It's what the worst case. Yeah, and you always think the worst case. You always, it's just human nature. And so, that's exactly what Jacob experiences. And that's consistent, though, with going even back into 31, where he said, I mean, he put up with all this stuff. Uh -huh. Ten times you changed my wages and everything. Well, most people would leave, but for him to leave, he... He's got to go back to the face. He doesn't yeah. he's excited about He's that. not anxious about that. Yeah. And maybe he was hoping, you know, we're 20 years away. Maybe uh, maybe, maybe Esau is dead. Although, uh, news, they didn't have Twitter and Facebook and cell phones, but they, yeah, they had caravans. News traveled. And so he probably knew Esau was alive. Um, well, we've got 400 people. Yeah. Or, no, excuse me. No, that's all right. <laughs> but anyway, he, he probably knew Esau was alive. But, you know, maybe he thought, well, 20 years' time, he's forgot all about it. And, but then when he hears that uh, Esau is coming to meet him, and he's not given, apparently, any more information than that, except that... Uh, Except that he's coming. The messengers returned to Jacob in verse 6. Well, uh, um, Jacob uh, sent messengers. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I really am getting ahead. Sent messengers to Esau, his brother, in the land of, uh, of Seir. 
indicating that he surely knew Esau was, was alive, although he can't be absolutely certain he knew. But uh, at any rate, he sends this message to Esau, apparently uh, to assuage, uh, to mollify, to smooth things over, you know, a, a gift, um, the bride in secret that Proverbs mentions. And messengers returned. We came to your brother Esau. He is coming to meet you at a 400 <laughs> Oh my goodness, this is not what I wanted to hear. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And you know, he divided the camp. And yeah, now he's in survival mode. He really does think now that Esau is coming to exact his revenge. He obviously does think that. And uh, so Jacob prays, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred. He's, uh, he's doing what actually Scripture encourages us to do in lots of ways when we pray, and that is to, uh, not, not that God needs to be reminded of His promises, but to call to mind the promises of God and to claim, lay claim to those. And He says, you're the one who told me to return to my country. Um, so, he says, uh, uh, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. Which would imply, uh, Lord, doesn't that mean that Esau won't kill me? <laughs> I'm not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown. For with you only my staff, uh, I'm sorry, for with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I become two camps. And so he acknowledges the great favor of God, the great blessing of God on his life. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother. So even though he lays claim to the promise, he doesn't presume. So we're, you know, already we're beginning to see perhaps another side of Jacob. And maybe this has been coming, maybe it's been building, maybe the experience with Laban has brought him to this point. But uh, at any rate, there it is. So he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. Uh, you know, gifts in the Oriental world are very important. Very important. And this goes back to ancient times. So, um, so he sent messengers ahead, course and so it ends at that I mean I mean the, the story is interrupted as we know and uh, with Jacob sending the messengers uh, ahead to meet Esau and again to try to mollify him and uh, so verse 21 says the present passed on ahead of him and he himself stayed that night in the camp the same night he arose and took his wives his two female servants, his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Now, as it happens, I have a picture of the Jabbok um, on my other computer. Well, I guess I, well, no, I don't have the cable or anything. I, I'd love to show it on the screen. But I don't think I can. Well, I'll just pass this around. And, um, When, um, not every time, of course, but once in a while when we go to Israel, we go to Jordan. And not the last time, but the time before, we went to Jordan. And we uh, stayed overnight a couple of nights in Amman and went north from Amman to Gerasa, one of the cities of the Decapolis. <coughs> And um, on the way there from Amman, and on the way back to Amman, we crossed the Jabbok River. And I have a picture of it. If I can find it. Let's see. Should be 
too hard because I just sent it myself not long ago. It's, I mean, this is not really the sort of thing you wait up all night to see, but uh, <laughs> but just you know, a kind of a picture of it. You're not too far from Sucker. Correct. You were mentioning earlier about where he was going to go Uh huh. And you said that's where you would cross. And in my mind, I was thinking, well, that's probably where Jericho uh, uh, might be close by. Because when we lived in New Arizona, one of the reasons that Yuma is there Yuma is Yuma. that's where you would you would cross the Colorado River. And as you work your way up, yep. about the only place you have towns is where it's safe to cross. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, the, the history of the towns, uh, how they got to be. And, yeah, a place to cross <laughs> the Yellowstone. Yellowstone. That's right. hey, absolutely. Ah, oh, here it is, I think. Let's see. Yep, that's it. It is. All right, there's the Jabak. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, not, but not deep. Yeah, it's wide, but not deep. And very rocky, as you see it there. And unchanged, uh, basically, from ancient times, as far as anybody knows. There's, you know, it's not dammed up or anything like that. It's just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll hold it up and yeah this is the picture uh, you just heard me mention I don't know if you can see this or not I'll hold it in front of the camera yeah there it is ah that's that's a pretty good picture I think it was verse it was verse 22 chapter 32 verse 22 Okay, there's the Jabak taken from uh, a bridge on the main highway down to Amman. We don't know if that's the place where Jacob crossed, by the way, but it uh, could have been because it's where the highway crosses. So it, it could have been. It makes sense that it might have been. Um, anyway, the uh, so he crossed the ford of the Jabak. He took uh, he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had and Jacob was left alone and the man wrestled with him one of the uh, most amazing uh, best known uh, and um, in some ways difficult to understand passages of scripture it's, it's difficult in part because the uh, the, uh, the man with whom Jacob wrestles seems on the one hand to be uh, outmanned and on the other hand to be omnipotent <laughs> because uh, the last verse the uh, or the next last verse um, I'm sorry not Uh, verse third, yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Those last verses interpret what we read in verse 25. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hip socket. Now, that's just a curious statement. When he saw that he didn't prevail, he touched the hip socket and made Jacob a cripple for the rest of his life. How can this be? What, what do you mean he couldn't prevail? Well, and, and the fact that uh, there is this wrestling that takes place anyway. And what does this mean? And who is this man? Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Well, and then 
the uh, the words of Jacob, even though he his hip is put out of joint, so he is basically incapacitated. Verse 26 says, but then he said, let me go, for the day has broken, as if he couldn't escape. But he didn't want to be seen either. He didn't want to be seen. Which, that's what I look at. It. Yeah, it yeah, it right, was, right. It was Jesus, some would say, would he have been maybe just in his bodily strength, his own yeah. as a human? Yeah, much as, as Jesus, the, the incarnate Son of God, was. Mm-hmm. He was. And he was thirsty and sleepy and yet just a touch but there again Jesus uh, can be thirsty and tired and sleepy and uh, and speak and Lazarus comes forth from the grave Mm -hmm. that strange mixture of omnipotence and weakness yeah because he allows it and that seems I mean, that's the only way we can really quite explain this, is that this is a picture of how Jesus ministered in as the incarnate Son of God. He was God and man at the same time. <coughs> uh, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself and made himself of no reputation, being found in fashion as a man. And yet he was gone. Well, um, so the, the the kind of crisis or the or the focal point of the whole passage, I think, is we recognize is Jacob's statement: "I will not let you go unless you bless me." So obviously, Jacob recognized there was something about this personage that was more than merely natural, and. Uh, Again, it's still it's still kind of strange. <laughs> it's still kind of strange because there there are things that we're just simply not told. But the heart of it is the blessing of what Jacob clearly believed was a, a messenger from God. What he thought about that exactly, but he, who, whoever this person was in Jacob's mind, he was authorized to give him a blessing from God. And so, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? Of course, presumably, the man knew. <laughs> but he's, uh, you know, we've said this many times before. God doesn't ask questions to get information. He asks questions to make us face questions or facts. And that's the case here. What is your name, Jacob? Well, Jacob, Jacob's whole life has been Jacob the supplanter, the heel, the one who grabs the heel. Uh, This is what Esau said. Is he not rightly called Jacob? So, the person, the man, asks, what is your name? It's Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And uh, the the name Israel means the, the one who strives with God or perhaps uh, just God strives. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So he's letting Jacob know that his wrestling here was um, in some sense with God. The, the reference to wrestling with men, um, maybe this has to do with uh, uh, facing Esau. And uh, even Laban, and the fact that he served Laban faithfully, even though he was mistreated. So all these are evidences that Jacob, who started, who who begins his life living by his wits, now is is uh, close to walking by faith. So it's a remarkable change point, and the name reflects that. No longer Jacob, but Israel. Of course, this is where the name of Israel derives, as, as we know. And uh, Jacob asked him, what is your name? <laughs> Essentially, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And uh, there he blessed him. Doesn't uh, A similar kind of answer 
that uh, the angel gave to the father of Samson, who asked his name. And the angel answers, why do you ask my name? But he adds, seeing it is wonderful. The name is wonderful. Whether that's descriptive or the actual name. But, uh, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, uh, the face of God. Literally. I have a former student who, uh, for a number of years, he's not there now, but a former student who was pastor of a church in Palatka, Florida, where Billy Graham preached, I think, his first sermon. Huh? Mm -hmm. I've been to Palatka many times. I, I mean, I practically grew up there uh, in the summertime. But uh, Palatka is a beautiful place, by the way. The St. John River flows through it. It's a, and in flat Florida, there is a place there called Ravine Gardens. And there's this amazing formation. It's a ravine in Florida. You would never expect to see. It's just beautiful, actually a beautiful place. But anyhow, my uh, former student was pastor of Penile. They called it Penile Baptist Church in the Palatka, Florida. I've preached in that church a few times. But, uh, yeah, it's, but it's taken from right here, the face of God. For I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And uh, here again, this is, this, this is something we run across a few times in the Old Testament, the idea that, that no man can see God and live. I have seen God face to face, and yet I've lived. Uh, same experience with Samson's uh, father and mother. <clears throat> so the sun rose upon him as he passed uh, Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, this day the people of Israel don't eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. An amazing, amazing story. But um, the, the import of it is, seems to be that this represents a real spiritual change point in Jacob's life. But uh, he hasn't arrived yet, as we're going to discover. He meets Esau. Our time is just about gone here. He meets Esau, as we know, and it's, you know, we've all said this since, since uh, probably most of us have said this many times over the years. Most of the things that you dread aren't, don't turn out nearly as badly as you think they are. And, and that's true. I mean, it really is true. We, we do tend to imagine the worst case scenario. We, we tend to think the worst. And Jacob certainly did, but it's still an amazing story because not only is Esau reconcilable, uh, he, he actually, uh, if anything, he seems almost to take initiative in, in reconciling. He wants to be reconciled. He, <coughs> no daring to hatch it here, this is a real reconciliation. It's, it's really quite amazing. And uh, so much so that he uh, offers to accompany Jacob, perhaps to help protect. He has, a, he has this virtual army of men. And uh, Jacob resists that. You know, you, I, I'm letting you in on all my uh, old dark secrets, but I used to think years ago, I used to think that uh, Jacob was maybe a little suspicious here and he was resisting Esau because uh, he was still, deep down, he was still really afraid. And I, I even thought at one time that Jacob deceived Esau. Because at the end of it, it says that um, uh, in verse 14, Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me, and at the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. So it sounds like Jacob is saying, I will, I will come to you. But he didn't do that. And I used to think, uh, okay, here's just Jacob being the, uh, the, uh, the heel again, the deceiver. But I've come to see, well, no, I don't think that's the case. I think, in the first place, I think his resistance was just typical oriental uh, thinking. That... Even though 
the, the way of the Orient is you show hospitality. You don't receive it. And uh, not, not that you don't ever receive it, I don't mean that, but what I mean is that the more natural uh, way is to, to be the one showing hospitality. That kind of puts you, in a way, in a superior position. If you're receiving the hospitality, you're somewhat inferior. And in our way of thinking, that may sound a little bit odd, but it really is the Oriental way. And so I think Jacob was just resisting on that account, not because he was suspicious or afraid or anything. And as far as visiting Esau at Seir, we don't know that he didn't do that ever. And he doesn't say, I'm going straight there. He doesn't say, I'm going to follow you straight to Seir. He just says, uh, let me do my own pace until I come to my Lord, suggesting that at some point down the way I will visit. And he may have. We don't know that he didn't or, or did. And we do know that he and Esau were together when... Isaac died. So, and we also must remember that he wasn't told by God to go to Seir. He was told by God to go to Bethel. And so he's got to go there first, no matter what. So anyway, I, um, you know, you think about these things more and more and the picture begins to crystallize a little bit. So Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And we're going to end there because our time is gone today. And <coughs> Miss Lily, I guess you're off the hook until Monday, as it turns out. So, But that's good. That'll be a perfect be way to begin next uh, class. So we'll plan to do that Monday. And the only thing I'd point out as we end is that Jacob comes, as we uh, said, not to Bethel, he goes to Shechem instead. Why Shechem? And I mentioned this before, I know, but I'll mention it again, that uh, all the, well, at several points in the Old Testament, but especially from uh, from Genesis here and then, all, and then again in Joshua, Shechem is a very important place. The renewal ceremony in Joshua takes place in Shechem, and then the final the farewell, uh, Joshua's final charge takes place in Shechem. Shechem, uh, how should I say this? Shechem is the New York of the Canaanites. It's the great city. It's the it's the capital of the Canaanites. Unofficially, but it's the, it's the capital. Why Jacob went there? Unless he was just drawn to the to the area to to this great city it's hard to say we don't we're not told exactly why but that's where he goes and he doesn't go to Bethel and we know this is important because in chapter 35 God said to Jacob arise 